Johnson begins to gather himself. He sees they. Ketchell's confidence soars. A perfectly timed straight right to the jaw smashes Ketchell to the canvas. Johnson's momentum sends him privily over the fallen Ketchell. Wipes two of Ketchell's teeth from his glove. <laughs> Shocking suddenness. Ted Johnson knocks out Stanley Ketchell and successfully defends his own way for now. Okay. 
you can see there, they tried to get the championship off Johnson through nefarious deeds, okay? Through a sucker punch. And you'll notice with that sucker punch, though, Johnson still had the senses to see that at the last split second, he didn't catch it full. But it was enough to knock him down and get back up, and he did exactly as he said he was do, going to do. He said, if he tries to hit me, he's going to pay for it. And he did. Got two <coughs> A sucker punch is he's not expecting it, okay, because he said he'd been carrying 12 rounds, yeah. the gunman, and he said he better not really try and knock me out when I'm not ready. Okay, so it's not a sucker punch in the traditional test, but it's a good job to pay attention. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I still call it a sucker punch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just might be. But anyway, so, there's no run off the wild race who can actually be Johnson. So what do they do? They followed Jack London's advice and they said, Jim Jeffries, you've got to come out of retirement. Jim Jeffries ballooned up to 330 pounds, put on 110 pounds in his alfalfa fun. So he decides to come back and fight Jack Johnson. Reno, Nevada, July 4, 1910. This was one of the fights they termed as the fight of the century. And there was a lot of press about it. And Jeffries' stated reason for coming back was to prove the white man is superior to the black man. Well, <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way. As you see in the left hand corner there, it was no match. Went for about 14 rounds, he destroyed him, played along with him, uh, trash talked him along the way. So he got more fire from the white community that was that thinking that way. So Jack Johnson has beaten Jeffries in the 1900s. So what did they do? Jack Johnson was such a thorn in society's side, and I'll be brief about what happened to him, but they decided to prosecute him for what they called the Man Act. The Man Act was some old statute that said you can't take, if you're a black man, you can't take a white woman across state bounds for immoral purposes. <laughs> so they said, we're going to put you in jail. They put him on a, what do they call it? I mean, what, do you, what do you do when you go to you get a you know, stage? You, he, he jumped bail. bail or something, you know? He jumped bail and went overseas. He wasn't going to go to jail. Right. And consequently, what happened about that time, too? Uh, there was World War I was happening as well. Right. So they couldn't find anyone. The, the heavyweight championship went into a bit of a hiatus. Uh, he fought a few times in London, France, beat everyone there, too. Until they finally found someone by the name of Jess Willard, the Potawatomi giant out of Kansas. Jess Willard stood six foot six and a half. Now that is huge for that time. That is very unusual. Remember, average height is five foot seven. Six foot six. Now you can probably see a couple of people walking around in the back around about that height. That's still tall, but it was extremely unusual in those days. And it was that unusual to have someone who's coordinated as well, someone who could actually throw punches and could have a bit of coordination. Don't forget, Johnson hasn't really fought for a couple of years, so now he's coming out to fight. They finally found what they hope is a great white hope. Now, the great white hope is six foot six and 245 pounds. Johnson, as strong as he is, is not going to be able to push him around. And this is what happens. Please have a word. <laughs> uh, 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 don't talk too soon, Michael. The fight starts calm. Both men are aware that they may have to go 45 rounds in a sweltering tropical zone. See the Cuba.
sitting dog. So Johnson used that. I mean, what you tend to find uh, after watching Brett Boxing for many years, and having seen it in my own life as well, is when someone gets beaten in boxing, and it gets pretty convincingly beaten, they're immediately sort of contrite about it and say, you know what, I was beaten by that man on the day. And that's what Johnson was reported to say. But after they get thinking about it for a little while and all their cronies are all around them, they say, no, 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 I could have beaten him. So that was what he claimed. He claimed he was shielding his eyes from the sun. He wasn't knocked out. I personally don't think so. You saw that punch, it landed. Johnson's skills, his bat-like reflexes deserted him. He actually copped on it. Unfortunately, he had to lose. But talking about losing, Jess Willard probably regretted the day that he ever did that, that he ever won that championship. Because he was about to face one of the iconic figures in sport, Jack Dempsey. Now, if there's a many, if there's a dictionary that's got the word tough written there, they should have Jack Dempsey's face written there. Right? Jack Dempsey was your archetype of the tough American in those days, a roused about, who left home at about 14. And he's, he's actually very interesting in ancestry, dark Cherokee, and he was a direct descendant from you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys. He was one of the Hatfields in that famous view. Okay. <clears throat> he went around from the age of 14, and remember these are different times in America, going from living in hobo camps, jumping on uh, freight trains, going from town to town. And again, going into taverns and saying, I can't sing, I can't dance, but I'm gonna be any man in the house. And he very rarely lost. So he was a tough, tough guy. A very charismatic guy as well. So, Jess Willard is going to now, and you can see the difference. Jack Dempsey, they say six foot one. I don't think so. I don't, to me, he looked about five eleven, six foot. He's fighting Jack Dempsey on July 4, 1909. The ringside temperature is 110 degrees. <laughs> right. Jess Willard is six foot six and a half, 245 pounds. Jack Dempsey, they say is six foot one. I think he's more about five eleven, weighing in at 187 pounds. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's hard.
right. He said, you got to let me give you anything. injuries that Willow got was reported to have broken his nose, teeth, jaw, cheekbone. Uh, Ferdy Pacheco, who was Dr. Ferdy Pacheco, who was Muhammad Ali's doctor for about 20 years, said in all of his years covering fights and treating boxes, he'd never seen anyone to get that sort of facial injuries. So the rumour was, the heavy rumour was, that Dempsey had stuck something in his glass. Okay. It's a plaster of Paris in his glass. Rumour was, when they came out at the start of the match, there's actually film of Willow looking at his hands because the rumour was out that he's going to put something in his gloves. The story then goes that Dempsey's trainer, Tex Rickard, who's another carnival guy, Don King before Don King, sprinkled what was supposed to be talcum powder on his gloves, but it was plaster of Paris, thereby making him like have a, a rock in his hand hitting him. That's one side. There's other sides to that as well. I'm just saying he was beaten by Jack Dempsey. He was a guy, big guy, a good fight. Beaten by Jack Dempsey with five ounce gloves. Also, my feet, if you have, and there's been, there's been done some trials done, if you have plaster of Paris in your hands, you're not hitting someone, you're going to break your own hand. My opinion is that he did. There's some who will swear and say that yes, he had something in his gloves. And I think they're trying to make an excuse because a little guy beat a big guy and beat him badly. Five ounce gloves. He's hit him in the face. So Dempsey has destroyed Willow. Dempsey went on to have a very successful couple of years. He became very popular. He did have some uh, a section of the public who didn't like him because he didn't fight for World War One. Some called him a slacker, but he said he had reasons for that. He had some family to bring up. It was people of mother, etc. He had to get money. Um, so the big match was set in. 1921, with a war hero from France, Georges Carpentier. 
and Dempsey destroyed him in about three rounds. But I wanted to show you just what boxing was like in those days. That's this photo on the left is the New York Times, uh, <coughs> Times Square rather, outside the New York Times uh, building office. That was the crowd, 10,000 people, little hats, waiting to hear news about Dempsey's fight with Carpenter's the airport down. That's just people in New York. That's how much of a big sport, an iconic sport, boxing was, and how popular Dempsey was as well. I promised I'd mention this one to Jim. <laughs> he fought a fellow out of um, Spain, I think, actually, um, Luis Ferpa, who's a big guy, not as big as Willard, but a big guy, big, strong guy. Not, not a great boxer, but he had happened to uh, hit Dempsey in the first round and actually knock him down. And it was a real surprise, a bit of a lucky punch. Dempsey got up and knocked him down seven times in that round. <laughs> but in the second round, Furpo full rushed him and knocked him out of the ring. And Dempsey fell on his backside, brought on a bunch of typewriters, right amongst all the journalists. And that's a famous painting you've seen a lot of man caves around. Okay, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's in uh, one of the major uh, flyers in, uh, in the city, in uh, Georgetown, oh. has a copy of that, uh, that painting. The big spur boat knocking Dempsey through the ropes. Dempsey got up off there, the, the journalist not pushed him through, and he destroyed Tim uh, by knocking him down like three times and one in two rounds. Okay? So Dempsey's becoming a very popular figure. Uh, he became part of the Illuminati, if you will. He became friends with all Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, the Roaring Twenties. He became one of the guys, one of the movie star type of guys. He had a following. Okay. So he didn't fight for about three years. There was no challenges around that were really going to challenge him. So after he fought Furbo, it wasn't until 1926 that another guy came along named Gene Tunney, the fighting Marine. Okay. Gene Tunney was a classic boxer. He was classic boxing style and could move around very clever. Dempsey by this time had lost a lot of his inner fury, so to speak, and he'd slowed up a little bit as well. And Tunney beat him quite convincingly in uh, the five points in their first bout. But then came another bout. It's another historic bout. It's called the Battle of the Long Count. September 22, 1927, Soldier Field in Chicago, 104,000 people. <laughs> watching the last time. Now, isn't that just outstanding? Let's see what happened then. Early on the morning of September 27th, we see an empty soldier's field, Chicago, Illinois. But just 12 hours later, over 100,000 fans, a live crowd greater than any attendance at any baseball game, watches as the first round of one of boxing's most controversial fights begin. Tony is wearing the light-colored trunks. The fifth and final billion-dollar game under the promotional reins of Tech River. This fight sets the record that may never be broken. Two million. $650,000 official gross receipts from a live game. Champion Gene Tunney will receive a cool $1 billion for 40 minutes worth. The fight itself follows a pattern similar to the first match. That is, until the fateful seventh round. Dempsey lands a potent right hand counter, follows up with a series of seven devastating punches. Tunney goes down for the first time in his career. Dempsey stays here the following fight. Referee Dave Barry points for Jack to move to a neutral corner. Only then does he begin the count. Is Tony dazed, or is he wisely taking full advantage of these precious extra seconds? Tony is up with the referee's count of nine. Now, watch that sequence again in freeze action with a stopwatch on the knockout. Tony has just hit the canvas, and we start the watch at zero. Jack has forgotten the new rule. The count does not begin until he gets to a neutral point. Instinctively, Dempsey stays nearby. Five seconds have elapsed before referee Barry is ready to begin the count. Gene looks hurt, dazed as the count begins. 
But he has the official count of four when nine seconds have actually elapsed. He's looking at the referee and picks up the numbers. You be the judge. Could Tommy have risen at this point? At the referee's count of nine, but after 14 seconds have elapsed, Gene is getting off the canvas. Then on a fashion way, he gets on a bicycle to stay away from a rampaging Dempsey who had scored only after 17 rounds of maddening frustration. going on in New York at that time when New York was pretty rough and ready. Two guys, two young guys, decided they were going to rob this elderly gentleman when he was sitting in the back of a taxi. That was their common modus operandi. One come from that side, one come from the other. Just happened to be Jack Dempsey. Block one side, block the other. Two down. In your mid-70s. So, he's still able to carry himself quite well, even if it's with a bad stage. Now, Gene Tunney, on the other hand, I won't just show this. I've got him No, Gene Tunney before that. But Gene Tunney, on the other hand, the fighting Marine, if you look back, he's quite a good looking chap, I suppose. Uh, had a bit of a heartthrob clientele or a following, but he never caught on like Jack Dempsey did. Even though he's a Marine, people distrusted Gene Tunney. Anyone 
know why. Now, he didn't go to taverns. He didn't sort of, like, didn't fight the city. He didn't chase wild women. I think he gave up to it, didn't he? He didn't do all of those things. But what he did, ladies and gentlemen, he read books. <laughs> he had the audacity and the temerity to actually read books. He was a pseudo-intellectual. He preferred the company of playwrights, authors, than the traditional boxing crowd. And the American at that time didn't really trust intellectuals, people who were more bookish. So he didn't really fit in with the boxing crowd. He actually even wrote a little article about how he felt after a concussion, and how he didn't think boxing was for him because it's making him start to lose his faculties a little bit. So he eventually retired. He didn't fight after four attempts. He'd only been beaten once. He got out while he was ahead. So, once again, the World Heavyweight Boxing Champion, Championship goes into a bit of a hiatus. They're trying to find a new champion. And along comes a fellow out of Germany by the name of Max Schmeller. He's going to figure very prominently shortly. Um, but he won off a fellow named, in a tournament of a fellow named uh, Jack Sharkey. He won, won by disqualification. He won the championship. Now, they had a rematch. Oh, in the meantime, I will say, before I get to this back with uh, Sharkey, a little later on, Moyes had become prominent. He beat, beat a fellow by the name of Joe Lewis. More on that later. Okay? So he became, he comes into the picture very much later again. Jack Sharkey came along, not a very popular champion. This is where boxing gets the heavy underworld of police at that time. Okay? Jack Sharkey fights Schmeling again, wins a very controversial decision, a split decision. They give the decision to Sharkey. The feeling is they don't want the championship to go over to Germany, because what's happening in the 1930s about that time? Right. Hitler's marching through Europe. So they want the championship over there. They've got to find someone here to keep it here. So Sharkey won what was a very controversial decision. He ended up losing to a fella by the name of Primo Canero, an Italian, and he was a huge guy. Now, this is where boxing is at its absolute worst. Okay, this is where the skullduggery and the nefarious characters come in. I doubt Primo Canero could beat any of us. He was, he was not a boxer of any means. All of his fights were fixed. We get some debate in boxing circles that says, you yeah, know, I know he could actually have a decent jab, etc. He was a huge man, almost as big as Willa, not as tall, but bigger, more muscular. They, had, they got him out of the carnival in Italy. Okay? He wasn't a Mensa candidate, let's just say that. <laughs> and he could box, but he was a big, fiercer looking guy. There's a photo of him next to Joe Lewis. He's six foot five, six foot six. Joe Lewis is six foot one, standing on a, a weighing scale. Look at the difference in size. Joe Lewis destroys it. Joe Lewis, in his book, talks about he couldn't understand how this guy ever got in a ring. He said, by the fifth round, he said, I'm actually picking him up off his feet. And he said, I'm supposed to be doing that to you. <laughs> he, wasn't, he just really had no athletic ability. He was really sponsored by the mob. Primo Panera. There was actually, that's right, two books written about Primo Panera. Uh, well, thinly discovered <laughs> novels and films. Part of a by Bull, Bud Schulberg, and a film with Humphrey Bogart, Bogart his last film, talks, it depicts a thinly disguised Primo Panera. Basically, all his fights were fixed. Okay. The mob got behind him. And there's even a rumor saying he didn't even know it. Okay. He thought these guys were actually, he was actually bleeding. He didn't know that they were fixed. Okay. I actually had the uh, pleasure of actually being a contemporary of his, who was in the same ring with him. He wasn't a boxer, he was a wrestler. A fellow by the name of Lou Fez and said, uh, did he have any athletic ability at all? And he said, well, Mike, if you consider walking and talking, athletic ability, that's about it. He said, he was put in there totally for the mob. But, and this is where boxing gets very cool. He lost his championship to a real boxer by the name of Max Baer. Max Baer was six foot two and had a lethal left foot. In fact, had actually killed
building something. Maxby was a real boxer. Bit of a happy go lucky guy. Slapsy Maxi, they called him. He fought Primo Canera, knocked him down 11 times in the fight. And it's, if you get it on YouTube, watch it, it's brutal. Because Maxi, he's standing there actually talking to the broads outside the ring. Smacking, chasing him around. It is really quite cruel. Putting a guy like that into the real boxer. So Max Fair is the champion, and they were thinking he might be the man to really keep the championship here, but he's a party guy. Slaps and Max, he likes getting out amongst the Illuminati. He loved partying more than he did training. But he's a lethal boxer. So they gave him a defense against a guy by the name of James J. Braddock. And this is what you alluded to, yes, Cinderella Man. Okay? James J. Braddock was a journeyman boxer, a nice boxer, not really great, but tough and hard. Remember, it was the Depression at that time. In that movie, Cinderella Man, great movie, great for the boxing scenes, and depicts the times very well. He came in, he had a lot to win the title for, and he did. He beat Max Beer and it's a huge upset. Now, the thing I'll say about that, that film, I think the boxing scenes are good, the way it depicts the Depression is good. But one thing about it, they depicted Max Beer very harshly. They made Max Bear, and I understand for films you've got to have a villain. They made him have to be a really heartless, soulless, cruel guy, and he was anything but. And I think it's still in the law, in the law courts. Max Bear's uh, son, who happens to be a TV star and fitness in it, so don't answer this question. Happened to be a TV star. Anyone know who Max Bear's son was? Out of the Hillbillies, Jeff Wright, Max Bear Jr has been taking this to court and fighting the producers with the way they depicted his uh, father to them. They say it really wasn't fair. And I did think that was unfair, the way they used poetic license. But anyway, James Dray Braddock comes along. So, who's he going to defend against? In the meantime, there's a young African-American boxer coming up. Remember this, Joe Louis. Joe Lewis? Lewis. Hey, Joe Lewis. Now, if you talk about the best heavyweight boxer of all time, if he's not in the discussion, you're in the wrong discussion. Okay. He was an absolute champion boxer. What he could do, if you want to close this down. His style was classic boxing style. From his feet left and right. Just knew how to stalk people. Better big guy, six foot two. Um, he'd come up through the ranks. But don't forget, in the meantime, I'll hit you up again, Crush. Don't put the hands up, don't worry. You won't get punished. In the meantime, as I showed you before, Max Bear had beat him. I mean, not Max Schmeling had beat him. Now, Max Schmeling had studied film of Joe Lewis fighting, and what Joe Lewis had a habit of doing was throwing a jab and dropping his hand in the jab. They drop that hand. So Max Baird takes a step and over with the right. So he developed a bad habit. He, he currently, he became a, a golf fan and didn't train as hard. So Max Baird beat him quite convincingly, knocked him out. So here's Joe Lewis. He's the champion, but he doesn't feel he's the champion because he hasn't beaten Max Schmeller. Right. So Big events. Lewis Schmel. When they talk about the fight of the century, this, in my mind, is truly the fight of the century. Don't forget this. It's World War II is imminent. Hitler's machines, propaganda machine, is out there. It's saying that Max Schmel is a symbol of Aryan supremacy. Manic supremacy. He's everything that embodies the German spirit and the Hitler spirit and the Hitler's anyway. He was anything but a Nazi sympathizer, by the way. Max Schmeling just happened to be a good boxer. He got caught up with it. So, fight was now. Fight of the century. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling, 
June 22, 1938. Let me give you some interesting facts about this fight, just how big it was. The largest audience in the history of a single radio broadcast. 70 million people were estimated to listen. Made the prison one of our members, um, Aid, if you remember, uh, Aid at uh, IFC, um, yeah. the older gentleman, he actually listened to this broadcast. He was on the channel in his 80s. He actually sat with his dad and listened to this broadcast. And old Hitler lifted the nationwide free air curfew on bars and cafes so that people could tune in to this broadcast. Broadcast of the second fight, along with other sounds of American history, preserved by the National Recording Registry at the Smithsonian. There was over 70,000 people in attendance at Yankee Stadium. Both political countries' leaders, Adolf Hitler for Germany and the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, sent personal messages to the fighters. Joe, we need muscles like yours to beat Germany. Now, it was heavily rumoured that Schmeling was going to come over here to try and defect. Jack Dempsey and his boxing pals were going to help his family defect over here. The rumour was a little too strong because Hitler wouldn't let his family travel there. Okay. So Joe Maximilian had to come over and represent Germany. And here's what see guys that was a big big event African American communities were enraptured over it. front page news and I'll finish off with Mayor, what a Mayor Angelou had to say about this fight, we can't do it in her dulcet tones, but this is the way she described it, my race groaned, it was like our people falling, it was another lynching yet another black man hanging on a tree this might be the end of the world, if Joe lost we were back in slavery on help. It would all be true. 
The accusation is that we were lower types of human beings and we are a little higher than apes. But if Lewis is to win, of course, and he did win, champion of the world, a black man, some black mother's son. He was the strongest man in the world. People drank Coca-Cola like Ambrosia and ate candy bars like Christmas. Such was the depth of field. So on that very point of note, guys, I'll finish off with the pre-World War II champion, which we're going to look forward to next time. These fellows like next Thursday, same time, Rocky Marciano, only five foot ten, only undefeated heavyweight champion. He's a lot of interesting conditioning techniques. Sonny Liston is a big bad bear who was very much heavily under mafia mob, whatever you like to call it, influence. The one, the only Muhammad Ali, Smoking Joe Frazier, Big George Foreman, and Iron Mike Tyson. Just some of the characters we're going to be talking about next week. On that note, I'd like to thank you, Crusher, for joining. Thank you very much for asking this.